in your children. Thank you for the grace we have received to share your word, to discuss the issue of spiritual gifts, something that has been lost over the years. Lord, we pray that we will not be people who learn to forget, who learn to apply, who learn to do. My Father, let your Holy Spirit wrap up this series of teachings so that by the time we round up on Monday or Tuesday, your name will be glorified even as you empower us to be all you planned us to be and to do all you wanted us to do. Thank you for answering our prayer. To you be all honor and glory. We we'll bless you for all intercessors who are on the line, praying, who are across the world. Lord, we pray for the family of your servant, Pastor Brenda Ward, one of the core intercessors upholding this commission. And today, as he's been laid to rest in his hometown, somewhere in Imo State, Nigeria, Ikeduro. Lord, we pray you comfort his wife, Beatrice, and his sons, and all those who are part of him, Lord. We lift up the family before you, we pray for the comfort of Holy Spirit. We pray for all the provisions. We pray for all the encouragement they need, even as they go on this unpleasant journey today. Thank you, Father, for we know you've answered us. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. Hallelujah. We want to thank the Father for his goodness, his mercy, his loving kindness. And please bear with us. It's not an easy thing. One of the people for 15 years undergathered this commission. No, not that way, this way. One of the people that undergathered this commission in the past 15 years. He was part of the awesome prayer team the Lord raised in the city of Owori, Nigeria. Who preceded this commission with prayer, soaking in prayer and warfare. One of those who has been till the very end meeting on first Sundays of each month for a vigil to pray, you know, is going to be with the Lord. Today, his family will be laid to rest. His motto remains, Pastor Brendan Wardle, gentleman, Pastor Brendan Wardle, a man who, unassuming, humble, and I ask you to please remember his wife, Beatrice, and his sons, Leave them up before the Lord throughout today. And as many times the Lord will prompt you thereafter. You know what? The brevity of life is something we all need to be aware of. You see, this brother, he was unassuming. But when he caught the revelation of what the Lord wanted to do with Africa in the last days, through this commission, and to birth the Omega Church, the one new man of Elohim, neither male nor female, young or old, that revelation did something in him. And he took the place of an intercessor and became one of the most consistent intercessors all through the period. And as my wife and I and our leaders here were, you know, ministering to the wife and sharing with her on Saturday, you know, we were so pleased that the Father brought some comfort and encouragement. I want to ask you again, Pastor Brendan Ward, whatever you remember, lift them up in prayer. We're trusting the Father that the Lord will raise more intercessors like him. He discovered a particular ministry of intercession and he soaked in it. And we know the Father is not going to leave his family alone. For us, it's not possible. We can't forget him. We will do whatever we can. And those of you who like to be part of that, that's fine. But I've showed his wife that we would stand with the family because he is part of this ministry. We don't forget soldiers got by. Father and brethren, today we look at lesson 19 of Spiritual Gifts and Judgment Day. Spiritual Gifts and Judgment Day. And then we look at Lesson 20, the Epilogue Part 1. Modernist theology is united in one thing, and that is removal of the issue of Judgment Day from the, uh, from the uh, consciousness of saints. The result is that saints become so fixated in what to get, how to get by, the, uh, how to fulfill their temporal needs, that they tend to forget that there's still a call to fulfill aspects of our calling. 
And so many people are not passionate in pursuit of kingdom purpose because once the framework of your mindset is about what to eat and drink, you will not have enough time to look at things of eternity. Brothers and sisters, we are created for a higher purpose in the kingdom. Matthew 6 verse 19 to verse 34 makes it very clear. That's one of the reasons why he said in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where cheese break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rot doth not corrupt, and where cheese do not break through nor steal. But where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. You know what? It's so important we know that. Listen, the brother who has left, Pastor Brendan, I can tell you, whatever the blessings, whatever the Lord accomplished through this commission, he has been part of it. And he's going to meet his master. The brother paid the price. He avoided strife, avoided quarrel. He just was devoted to the Lord, above the pay grade of the many people of this generation. Men and brethren, the father also said in verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold on to one and despise the other. You cannot serve Elohim and Mammon. Brethren, so these things are no longer popular. They are no longer taught. They are no longer taught. People tend to think, oh, if you teach it, means people will not, people will not prosper. No. Greater prosperity is in the heart of those who understand these principles. And when they flow in these principles, whatever the Lord ordained to do through you, he will still do it. Not everybody is going to handle wealth as an asset, but the Father guarantees the need of all his people the curtain is no longer there for the issue of wealth. It's more of the issue of you fulfilling destiny. So we have a choice. Either focus on the Lord or focus on our belly. As Paul told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 3 from verse 17. Brethren, he said, Be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. Then he said, For many walk. He didn't say few. He didn't say a little. He said, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Yeshua. They are adherents of the new plastic cross. They despise the old rugged cross. Then he said in verse 19, whose end is destruction? Whose God is their belly? Whose glory is in their shame? Who mind earthly things? For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, our Lord Yeshua, who shall change our vile body, and that it may be fashioned unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue all things to himself. So, brothers and sisters, the Lord wants us to know that there's a grand equalizer. Spiritual gifts are one of the grand equalizers in the sense that everybody who is born again, you have one or two or three or four or more spiritual gifts. The Lord gives to you even from the new birth. We've told you the time you were born again, when Holy Spirit sealed you into the body, certain gifts were parted into you that define your new DNA. They are from your father. They are part of his DNA in you. Then if you press forward to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, there are other enabling power gifts that are put in you, especially described in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Men and brethren, and if you are called to the fivefold, there are some other, you know, office gifts that are given to you for the purpose of that you be used to make others mature, be perfected, and discover their part in the body. So what we need to understand is this. That Holy Spirit in us is a grand equalizer. His gifts in us is grand equalizer. If it is so, then we need to know that the Father doesn't want us to be known by our gender, known by our ages, known by our sizes, known by our weights. As I've told you before, Brother Samuel, you know, from the time we saw him, I mean, the brother is young enough to be my son. That is the reality. But you can see the grace in him, the passion in him, the zeal for the Lord in him. So you know what? You receive him. That's why the Bible says in John and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have not Yeshua after the flesh, we yet now henceforth know we him no more. That's why we can receive a prophet Jeremiah. 
in his office as a national prophet to, uh, to America in this time and era where the old prophets, they've grown dim. They are no longer seeing the strategic picture of the end time. The Lord is raising new prophets who understand the times. That's why we can receive Prophet Rolanda, the zeal of the Lord, the passion for prayer, for intercession, for worship that is upon her. We don't judge people by their agenda. Men and brethren, the Lord wants us to come to the place where we receive people according to the spiritual gift manifested in them because the Father put it in them and he brings it out and it's for purpose of edifying the body, for empowering the body, for encouraging the body and we receive it. We're no longer looking at gender. We're not looking at age. We're not looking at wealth. We're not looking at those things. And that's why we need to understand some relevant scriptures again and again. Remember in Luke chapter 19, Yeshua told them something because we're told in verse 11, as they had these things, the conversation between him and Zacchaeus, in the house of Zacchaeus, he added and spake a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of Elohim should immediately appear. So what he told them next was on the basis of their wrong assessment, they say, this man, he's been around us for some time. Now, perhaps, that kingdom he came to announce is about to appear. And Yeshua wanted to tell them something, brethren. And we need to understand what he wanted to tell them. And that is this, that look, even though he came to announce the kingdom, the time for his full establishment is not yet. So the kingdom he came to bring is to be received in the heart when we enthrone him as Lord and Savior. We return in throne him as king over our lives. But there will be a time when they manifest kingdom in its fullness, a kingdom of universal peace, of righteousness, no terrorism, no wars, no crisis, no car crash, no aircraft crash, no submarine crash, no accident, no wild beast, a time of universal righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost when he will come to continue to show us what the world would have been like if Adam and Eve had not sinned. That is the kingdom. The kingdom he will restore on planet Earth and he will be the ruler of that kingdom. He will sit in Jerusalem on the seat of David to rule the whole world as the only potentate, the only one who is not just a king but with authority to make all things. And then he is going to bless and reward those who were faithful on earth. They discover their part in him and they diligently pursue their part. They served out, they overcame. He will appoint them over the and territories over cities to rule on his behalf. That's how we're going to be co heirs with him. That's why we're going to be co rulers with him. So Yeshua told them this parable to know that between the time you go up and come down, there will be a span of time. The span of time that is called the church age, when after the falling away of the of, of Israel in the natural from understanding what Elohim was saying allowed to pack somewhere he was going to give the Gentiles an opportunity to drive the gospel and they were warned. Remember what happened to Israel. Don't go and be wise in your own conceits. Don't make the same mistake that the Gentiles have made even worse mistakes than Israel. So he told them in verse 12 he said therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. That's himself. He went to get back the throne because the father exalted him after he gave his life at the cross. You know, the joy that was set before him for which he endured it. He was exalted to go back to the right hand of the father. He went into the kingdom. He went to a far country heaven to return. He called his ten servants and said unto them, and delivered unto them ten pounds. And said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Do kingdom business. Do my business. I planted you on earth for my purpose. I'm, I'm giving you the resource with which to go and do the work I sent you. Far be it from Elohim to create us, redeem us, and leave us on our own devices. And among the facilities, among the equipment, among the assets, the Father put in every believer for the purpose of occupying or doing kingdom business until he returns a spiritual gift. Men and brethren, that's what he told them there. Then in verse 15, it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded those servants to be 
called to him, to him you had given the money that he might know how much each man had gained by trading. The Lord is saying that a day will come when he'll return and he'll be interested to know how much each of us was able to use the gifts and callings in us for the purpose of advancing his kingdom business. Did we use it for our belly? Did we use our gifts and callings to make money and exclude those who don't have money? Did we write revelation from him and insist on putting a price that is above, above the pay grade of the average person? And that revelation, they needed to be who the father wanted them to be. They didn't get it because we put the price of that book so high that it was beyond them. Oh, you said you got inspiration for your worship music. What did you do with it? Did you go and your calculation is to put it on iTunes store that people, 500,000 people will buy for $10 each and you make so much money and it govern you and you excluded those who that worship will have elevated to rise up to the level where the Father called them to be. Ben and brethren, the father says, Yeshua will return. The king will return. Never forget for a moment the king will return. And I say to you, the king is coming. All the infrastructure for the man of sin has been laid in Israel, in America, across Europe. All the infrastructure for the man of sin has been laid. All it takes is just one catalytic shift and the end is upon us. He said, watch and pray. How many people are watching? How many people are praying since I lost in partisan politics and hitting at each other, you know, lacerating the body? And the Lord said, the king is coming. He's going to require account when he comes. Men and brethren, then verse 16, then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound had gained 10 pounds. This brother or sister invested all he was given, gave it, gave it diligence and got 100% reward back for the king. Verse 17, he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a little, very little, thou shalt have authority over ten cities. The reward is to come in time and in eternity. When the king comes, there are those he's going to give great coverage area. Area beyond their wildest imaginations because of their faithfulness in the now. Verse 18, and the second came saying, Lord, thy pound I gave ten pounds. And he said likewise to him, be thou over five cities. 100% reward. Men and brethren, there will be great rewards for those who use their spiritual gifts to expand the kingdom, to establish the, uh, the, heart, the, the king in the heart of people, to enable people to walk in their identities and in the fullness of their counsel. Verse 20, and another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and repairs what thou did not sow. Look at this man, accusing his master for being a wicked person. The, ma the, the master knew the capacity of this one, and gave him what he could carry. Instead of using what he was giving to him, that spiritual gift of helps, that spiritual gift of compassion, that spiritual gift of you know showing mercy, that spiritual gift of ministry. Instead of using it, we're busy looking at that apostle, that prophet, that evangelist, that pastor, that teacher, that ability to lead 35 people for the Lord and give them pastoral care. Somebody neglected it because he was looking at that one with 40,000 on television. He feel angry, feel offended. He's accusing the Lord of being partial. But the Lord knew your capacity. If you go to Matthew 25, he said he distributed several to everyone according to their ability. The Lord knows your capacity. Men and brethren, it's time to stop looking at other people. It's time to look in what to say. What are the full range of things the Father gave to you? If you are called to the fivefold, did he give you twofold or threefold? Discover them. If you are called to body ministry, the ministry in the body, discover the full range of gifts and callings he gave to you. Brothers and sisters, because a day is coming when he will bring judgment. A day is coming when we are going to stand before him to account for how we used, the diligence with which we exercise, to account for whether we truly gave it our best shot or were we casual about it. Look at Yeshua, what Yeshua told that man who accused him of being austere. Then he said in verse 22, he said unto him, Out of thy own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taken up what that I laid not down, 
and reaping what I did not sow. Wherefore then, givest not thou my money unto the bank, that at my coming I have required my own with ocean. Why didn't you then invest it, you know, in something that has what they call, uh, 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 you know, um, re retentive income? Why didn't you put it in something that has capacity to produce income on its own? If you were too lazy, if we're too disoriented, if we're too disorganized to utilize my gift in everyday life, why not put it in the bank? Let residual income come out of it so that I can have some interest with my money. Then he said to them, that stood by, verse 24, 25, take from him the pound and give it to him that had 10 pounds. They said unto you, what? They had 10 pounds already. Why are you giving me extra? But I said unto you, that unto everyone the heart shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that which he had shall be taken away from him. But those my enemies which would that, I will not rule over them, bring them here and slay them before me. This talks about the unbelievers who say, you will rule over us. That's what they are doing now. The unbelievers who are running their own show. They are living by their own laws. They have neglected the laws of the kingdom. And they don't care about the king, about his feelings. And they are doing whatever they like. The day is coming. Men and brethren, the Lord is saying there will be harsh judgment for those who do not use their spiritual gifts to serve Elohim and his kingdom. He considered them as wicked. The same principle is in Matthew chapter 25, from 14 down. And men and brethren, the Father knows our capacities and he wants us to take note. There are two judgments ahead. Brethren, there will be the judgment of unbelievers, the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. Verse 11 to 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, and from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before Elohim, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up her dead, which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's so important we know that those who do not receive the Lord, those who deny him, you know, the, the salvation the Father offers them freely in him. A day will come, they will stand in judgment because Elohim has committed judgment of everybody on earth to Yeshua. So anyone who refuses salvation has already decided their late fate. Some people say, oh, we let Elohim cast anybody to the lake of fire. Isn't that mere illustration? No, it's not mere illustration. Elohim doesn't cast anybody. People make a choice. The choice to receive the salvation when he goes it, he stretches out his hand of salvation in Yeshua. If you receive it, you escape damnation. When you ref refuse it, you have chosen to be with the devil who becomes the leader of that person. And one will spend eternity with that ruler over the life here on earth. And not only unbelievers are going to face judgment. Listen to this. Those who say they are believers... They prefer to live a lifestyle where they are controlled by Satan, their passion, their impulses, their emotion. Everything is controlled by Satan. Look at what the Bible says in two passages. So that those who have been beaten by the bog of one saved, always saved, take note of what the Lord says. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim, be not deceived, neither fornicators, no idolaters, no adulterers, no effeminate, no abusers of themselves with mankind, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revelers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom. So if people in the church and these are their lifestyle, he said there will be no inheritance of the kingdom. There will be damnation. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. 
Men and brethren, this calls us to subordinate, to make sure we do not deceive ourselves because the shortest distance to hell, the shortest distance to the lake of fire is the place of revelation of truth, which is the church of Yeshua. Anywhere you are where truth is exposited and people choose to live contrary to the truth, that is where real problem lies. And so, men and brethren, the Lord wants us to know that for those who are saved, the judgment that they are facing or will face is not the judgment of the great white throne judgment, but the judgment of the judgment seat of Yeshua. Second Corinthians 5, 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Yeshua, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he had done, whether it be good or bad. The judgment seat of Yeshua is the place where there will be assessment of how did we use our gifts, how did we use our callings, how did, what did we do with it, did we put it to maximum use, or were we distracted by our belly, by our needs, did we give it the best shot? You see, believers are used to uh, you know, being casual with the things of the Lord, but when it comes to their business, they are very fastidious. They make sure that everything is done. The truth, the question is, do you? Take Elohim's work casually. The kingdom things are they secondary to you. If it is so, your gifts and callings will not be fully deployed for the purpose of giving him optimum and maximum profit. And the Lord expects us as stewards of the mystery of grace, stewards of what he put in us to make sure that everything needs to be done, that we are fulfilled and the king gets reward for what he put in us. For by way of assignment on this first one, question number one, please share three main things you learned from this lesson. What are three things you learned personally? Two, what scripture cited in this chapter strike you as a truly serious warning to sins of this generation? Which one touched you so you know? Men and brethren, when I go to lesson number 20, epilogue part one, part two will continue on Monday. Part two, I mean part one, epilogue, epilogue of spiritual gifts. Men and brethren, the Lord wants to remind us certain truths. We are told in Philippians 3, 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but to you it is safe. What are those safe things? Number one, liberty and order. If we are going to practice spiritual gifts, Let's learn to practice them in liberty in the spirit. And let's also learn to practice them with order by the spirit. Liberty in the spirit to exercise your gifts and callings. Order by the spirit whereby we allow Holy Spirit to temper our utilization with balance. So that there is balance. Men and brethren, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, Now the Lord is that spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And yet, he tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, quench not the Spirit. And Ephesians 4, 30, grieve not the Spirit of Elohim, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. We are sealed to the day of redemption. Don't grieve him with the way you do your... If you use your spiritual gifts to cause strife and competition, you grieve him. If you use your spiritual gifts to stop the flow of the Spirit... Or it make others not to exercise theirs, you quench him. If you know that you have been given spiritual gifts, the Lord says, as every man has received the gift, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. So exercise the gift. You are still what? As Holy Spirit prompts you, bring it forth. But we are required to do things decently and in order. That's why 1 Corinthians 14 was given. So that Satan and demons do not take advantage of fleshly display of spiritual gifts to invade a ministry of congregation. Remember what he said. Don't go and use tongues to speak at the pulpit. So they think there's a message from the Father. Because if they say amen without understanding, you are setting them up. That if any evil person or agent of Satan creeps in and causes the congregation, they say amen and that cause happens. How many Pentecostal churches have suffered these things? Just because people didn't know that you don't just use the gifts anyhow. You use them by order. And men and brethren, that's why it says to us, let's balance these two. 1 Corinthians 14, 39, 40. Wherefore, brethren, 
convert to prophesy so that we'll hear what the Lord is saying. Yet he says, forbid not to speak with tongues. Don't shut it down. Don't because of some people have misused it to shut it down totally. And so people no longer speak in tongues. People are, are no longer want to know. There should be tongues should be free. When worship is going on, when prayer is going on, tongues should be free. Both congregational worship, congregational prayer, or when worship is going on, people can just communicate the Father in tongues. What he says we shouldn't do is to go to the pulpit, take a microphone, speak in tongues when there is no one with the gift of interpretation, or you who is speaking don't have the gift of interpretation. The Father has given us this instruction for safety. Verse 4, he says, let all things be done decently and in order. And then the Father has something interesting he wants to tell us. And that is this. Between liberty and order, there is a balancing act. And that balancing act is authority. Authority brings the balance between liberty and order. Where there is authority, there will be flow of gifts. And where there is authority, there will be order in the flow of gifts. And that's why it is dangerous to want to exercise your spiritual gifts, but you don't want order. You don't want the Lord's order to prevail. You are just going to open the door for confusion and satanic activity. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 13, there are a lot of people who, you know, are born again, but the entire concept of order is oppressive to them. They don't want to hear about order. They don't want to hear about authority because they've been led to believe a lie. That the Father has no leadership. Look at what he said in Romans 13. Let every soul, every soul, be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of Elohim. The powers that be are ordained by Elohim. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of Elohim. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to do evil. Without them not to be afraid of the power, do that which is good, and thou shalt receive her praise of same. For is the minister of Elohim to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of Elohim, and a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, he must needs be subject, for not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause he paid tribute also, for the Elohim's ministers attending continually unto this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. You know, this passage is talking about both spiritual and natural leaders over us. That's why don't be part of those who take your president, your governor, your senator, and make caricature, and people are laughing on social media and putting all kinds of things and speaking evil and calling them all kinds of expletives. Don't be part of it. Don't. No ruler, no leader, whether spiritual or natural, just took himself and installed himself in office. It's not possible. The Lord allows it. Yes, you might say, well, is there, this person is negative. This person is evil. Listen, the Bible says the Lord raised Pharaoh through whom he will show his power. There are times you don't know the purpose the Father raised allows somebody to emerge. When you fight that person, you are fighting the very person that gave him that authorization. So if you're a child of Elohim, learn to be under authority, humbly, joyfully. Don't let it be imposed on you. Be one who is under authority. Don't just do things anyhow you like. We're told in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them that have the rule over you and spoken unto you the word of Elohim, whose faith follow concerning the end of their conversation. Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself. Obey them and submit yourself. Why? For they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Brethren, listen to this. There are three reports. Every leader, every spiritual leader, every authority of Elohim gives three reports. One is a report of indifference. He has no report to give because you don't appear on the spiritual radar. You are not involved. You just come to church with a Sunday, Sunday Christian. When he's praying, they don't often leaders 
Don't scan those people. They pray general prayer for them. There are two sets of people the leader focuses prayer on. One, those who give them hassle, who give them trouble. The pastor stays before the Lord all day, brings a proposal to a presbytery meeting, and the presbyters are people who are doing their business all day. They close by 6 p.m. or 5 p.m., and they drive to church, and pastor tells them what the Lord led in the heart. This presbyter wakes up and says, rise up and says, Father, pastor, I want to say something. We can't do it for now. Just leave it, pastor. Presbytery, this is what the Lord led me. I said, no, forget it, pastor. We can't. Our cash flow won't permit. Just like that. And because a man of influence, everybody goes that way. Pastor is frustrated. He goes before the Lord. If he's very carnal, he begins to pray dangerous prayer. Oh, Lord, look at what these people are doing. They are resisting your work. Father, deal with them. Show them you are God. That's a carnal pastor. If he's a spiritual pastor, he begins to intercede. Father, have mercy on these sins. Look at the way they are blocking your work without even knowing it. They don't know what they are doing. Lord, open their eyes of understanding. and help them. You know what? Whether he prayed dangerous prayers, they call them, or he prayed a prayer of mercy and love, it is a report of grief. It's a report of grief. The Bible says it's not profitable for you. It's very, very unhealthy for you that what goes up before the Father for any leader is put you under his report of grief. Now, look at the other person. Whenever pastor raises an issue, what the Lord is laying on the heart, but say, Pastor, let's go for it. We, we are well able. We are well able like the two spies. We are well able. Let's go for it. Pastor, count me in. And, you know, one pastor is praying, Oh, Lord, oh, look at this brother. Oh, Father, if we, I had just 20 of them, we would take over the nation and world. Father, bless them. Lord, empower them. Look at their zeal for you. Look at their commitment for you. Lord, have your, let, just show them your mercy. Bless them unto the third and fourth and fifth generation. You know what? That's a report of joy. That is why any leader you cannot submit to, it is actually better you leave. Honestly. This is not often said. And if you have concerns, raise it with the leader as graciously as possible about areas that you have concern. So you don't stay and you are striving, striving, lest a leader render negative report over you. Men and brethren, we are to know no man after the flesh. So we cannot embrace Levitical systems. We cannot embrace Nimrodic systems. You cannot exercise your spiritual gifts truly in a Nimrodic setting because in a Nimrodic setting, it's only one man who is alive. To exercise these or gifts, others are coming to be consumers. In a Levitical system also, it is also implied. It's the, about the organization. It's not about the people. The organization is the issue. And his own priest, they dress in priestly robes. They are closer to Elohim. Others are laymen. You cannot be fulfilled in a Levitical and an embodied system. And so the Father wants us to be people who realize that the gifts the Father has put in us, they are for expression. And men and brethren, that's why the Lord wants us to beware of what religion has done. Religion has demonized women. Religion has demonized women. And one of the things they use is some of the scriptures that Paul wrote. For instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34, 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as self so said the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it's a shame for women to speak in the church. Men and brethren, listen. For us to understand scripture, we rightly divide it. We understand context and content so that we can know what it's saying. It's so important for us to know that the early church in this place, Corinth, where Paul was writing, for instance, you know, this is a Gentile land and the Jews who migrated by you know, immigration, they, by immigration, they were now in Corinth. In that area, the men used to be in the synagogue alone, learning. Women were out there, up there. They were not in the real center of flow. The way the synagogue is built, they were just behind. And here is the people who are now born again. And so in that gushing of joy, of liberty, of being born again, some of the women went over the top. They go to a church in the synagogue. As the speaker is speaking, they'll rise up 
and say, no, I don't agree with that. I say, no, 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 that's not it. Or maybe they interrupt a prophetic word or whatever, or a teaching or preaching, and that disorder that was in the church in Corinth, Paul now said, listen, keep quiet. If you have anything, ask your husband. Be on the authority of your husband. He wasn't speaking it as women. Every woman, you just be there. You, no matter how much you are gifted and called, you are now under any man. No matter how not gifted or not called, no, that's over the top. How do you know? Paul was the instrument the Lord used to expound the Melchizedek priesthood more than any other person. Paul was the instrument the Lord used to show that his Holy Spirit that is responsible for salvation, conversion, his work, he convicts. As Yeshua told us in the book of John, Paul expounded it and showed us what happens, the process of conviction, and that he seals us into the body. And Paul taught on spiritual gifts. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are all in the spirit man of sins, the heart of sins. The spirit man, he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. The spirit man is neither male nor female. The gifts are neither male nor female. So Paul taught a liberating gospel. He was addressing some cultural issues, some practical issues that manifested when there was disorder by people who were liberated. So you have to understand the polite epistles fully in context to know that Paul couldn't have meant that women were not qualified. And so it is in the area of spiritual gifts you understand that all gifts, everything you can do in the house of the Father must be based on a spiritual gift. If the gift is not, the mantra is this, Whoever has it, bring it forth. We're not looking at your age. We're not looking at your ability. We're not look Listen, there are things favor my daughter can do. I cannot do. Electronics, computers, just give favor. Or elect, internet, things you can fix, no way. Arise, my daughter, things that these three children, it's as if they are whiz when it comes to many things I can't do. Pastor Grace, listen, there are many things I cannot do. She does very well. I don't even try to touch them. I see to her there because Bible talks about submitting yourself one to another. You know, people ignore that. There are areas in our family and ministry, she has greater grace and I live. Why do I have to struggle when the Father has, and we are one. And brethren, it's important we know that when we come to the issue of spiritual gifts, we know that the Father wants us, we have begun in the Spirit, we understand things of the Spirit, we shouldn't, like Galatians 3.3, 3, go back into the flesh. If we do that, we're not helping ourselves. So, let's take some questions and answers before we close today. What the spiritual gifts say of the ministry the Lord calls us to? In other words, is there a correlation between spiritual gifts and ministry? The answer is yes. The Lord has ordained that every ministry, every calling He gives to us is undergirded by a particular sets of spiritual gifts. So important. So that we don't present the gospel in words of men, in natural ability, but by Holy Spirit and power. In other words, spiritual gifts are manifestations of Holy Spirit. It's not us turning him on and off at will. It's him using our vessels to manifest Yeshua just when he pleases. So it's so important that we understand that. Question two, what are the dangers of operating outside our spiritual gifts? Whenever we operate outside our spiritual gifts, one is engaged in dead works. Dead works refers to activities that are not rooted in our gifting. They are not rooted in what Elohim has ordained to do through us. We are just doing it out of orthodoxy, out of habit. We are doing it out of strife. We are doing it as part of organization. And the other thing is that when we do not allow our gifts to drive what we do, flesh comes in. Flesh refers to the union of emotion, union of the soul and the body. When they rule what we do by what we see, what we hear, it's very dangerous. And the saint in such a state is subject or open to manipulation by the devil because the devil can use your emotions to deceive you. If you're an intercessor, and you allow your emotions to drive you. Your emotion, there are times your emotions are low. You don't feel like praying. If your emotions drive you, you will not pray. But when you are imbued with a sense of duty, and the spirit of intercession is upon you, the Lord will borrow your vessel and speak through you and intercede. Another question is this. 
is the presence and exercise of spiritual gifts the only basis of success in ministry? If not, what other things are essential? The answer is no. The, that, there are, that spiritual gifts are the basis of ministry doesn't mean it is all. There are other things outside of spiritual gifts that combine to make up what is called the spiritual DNA of each saint. Every saint has a spiritual DNA. Every saint, the DNA varies. And it is the mix of factors that it includes, for instance, character or fruit of the Spirit. It's part of your, if you're a pastor, you need the fruit of the Spirit in great measure. Everybody needs it, but you need it in greater measure than, say, an evangelist. In greater ripening, that's what I mean. Everybody needs the fruit, but yours needs to be more manifested because the evangelist may be abrasive by his calling and the Lord may just allow that abrasion because he has to deal with powers of darkness. You, you are managing saints. But everybody needs a measure. I mean, full the, the fruit of the Spirit, but there are measures of it. Now, it includes natural talent. The talent you need for a particular uh, office or particular ministry may not be the same as others. Personality. Personality matters according to the call of Elohim upon you. He gave you that personality. Education and training matters. One of the reasons why Paul was used mightily by the Lord, he was a man who knew the law. He, his, his mentor was Gamaliel. Gamaliel was his tutor. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He understood the old covenant. He knew it. If you read the book of Hebrews, you know a man who knew the law. Skills acquired is part of it. Skills acquired. The skills you acquire, don't waste them. Opportunities the Lord provides for you. I had opportunities to share the gospel, opportunities to expand the gospel, opportunities where there are new territories for the Father to use you. Attitude of life, they are all part of it. And a full teaching of this is in the book, Ministry, Discover, Pursue, Fulfill. On the website, www.kingdombooksclub.com, that book will blow you up. Every ignorance, it will affect it. We urge you to go to get that book and read it. The other question now, is this judgment day real? The answer is yes. There's a day coming. For those in Yeshua, there's a day he will check up. He will take account of what we did with our gifts and callings. What did you do with them? How did you expand them? Did you do it as if your, it's your own? For you to do whatever you want? Or did you allow Holy Spirit to completely, totally, wholly consume you? with the zeal of the Lord, and excise it all. Even in excising it, did you use every facility available? In these days, where there are tools, Facebook Live, YouTube, where there are tools, Vimo, Vimo, you know, there are tools, Ovo, there are tools, all kinds of tools. How many of them did you diligently use? In the place where you work, in your business, the kind of investment of time and effort you make to Deploy everything to end favor with your bosses or end more profit for yourself. When it comes to the things of Elohim, are you casual? Are you indifferent? Are you one who is giving to average? There's an enemy called average. You know, one of the places in the book of George, he said, Cause ye meros, cause ye in the inhabitants of the city bitterly. For they did not come to the help of the Lord against the mighty. There's a sin called indifference. There's a sin called indifference, non-challenge in the house of Elohim. The Lord wants us to be people who are zealous for the fullness of the manifestation of his grace. To give it our attention. To give it all we can. Not to take anything about him casually. The gifts in us, every possible way of manifesting the gifts, every possible way of using it to impact the largest number of people the Father has appointed us. If we give ourselves over to prayer, He will show us, He will reveal to us, He shows destiny help us, He shows people He will use as ladder to bring forth the grace in us. And the Father is saying, invest your all to make it real. Don't withhold. Don't treat the things of Elohim casually. Don't die with your gifts still intact. The box of your gifts need to be broken. 
like Mary, broke the, the alabaster box and the spike now, the fragments filled the whole house in John 12. The Lord is saying it's time to break the box, the alabaster box that is shielding your gifts and calling. Listen, at times the problem is our tabernacle. It's like alabaster God. We are holding your tabernacle, the box of your life. You are holding so preciously. You are not giving it attention. You you don't want to. You don't want to ruffle feathers. You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to uh, subject the flesh to any suffering. You just want life. Is remember, in eternity, you will account for going to sleep when you should be doing the work of the Lord, for ignoring the things the Father wants you to do, for shunting them aside. For Holy Spirit speaking to you, you think it's nothing. You know what the Lord wants to achieve in this series, this course on spiritual gifts? He wants to blow us up. He wants to break open the alabaster box because the treasure is in eighteen vessels. That eighteen vessel is our flesh. That eighteen vessel needs to be broken so that the fullness of the fragrance of Yeshua within can come forth and waft up through cyberspace, through those who are in day-to-day contact with us, the glory shall be made manifest. Take your place. Get to give your spiritual gifts grace. Suppose you have the gift of discernment, gift of dreaming dreams and seeing visions and prophecy. We need those revelatory gifts. Stand time in the presence of the Lord. Subdue your tongue. If you open your tongue, he closes your eyes and ears. You can't see and hear. But if you close your tongue and be a man or woman of few words, you will see, and what you see will help the church to navigate, and they will not make mistake. Everything the Lord has given to us, He knows what He wants to use it to accomplish, and He wants us to come to that place where we give Him right of way to lay hold of us, use all of us to bring forth all that He has ordained. When that happens, we are on safe ground, and on that note, we take this assignment. Please summarize any three of the key points in this chapter, in this lesson, that have perfected your understanding of spiritual gifts. What is it that has been said here? Three, three of them, of all that we said, that have perfected your understanding of spiritual gifts and enabled you to make a decision. I want to ask you that question again. If not you, who will discover, pursue, and utilize the spiritual gifts for the purpose of the king? And the second question, if not now, when? The Father loves you. That's why he gave you the gifts he gave to you. He said, open up. Let me reveal to you all. Let it not be said that after this teaching, any brother or sister came out of this training the same. Let there be some shift. And it will depend on your attitude to the world. And that's why I want to enjoin you. Go and listen. Today is 20 lessons so far. Listen to them. Give yourself over. This is important. Eternity calls. We'll pray now and I'll make the announcements. Father Lord, we thank you because we've you've used this vessel to speak your word today. Let no one despise your word. Let no one shunt it aside. Let no one miss what you are saying in the now. Help everybody by your spirit. To come to the place where we wholly and completely manifest your grace. That the gifts and callings will come forth. Let every alabaster box break. And let there be such a, an effusion of your gifts and callings in your kingdom church worldwide. That no one will know us after the flesh. And everyone will bring forth what is inside. And your name will be glorified because the gifts glorify you. We take no glory. You take all the glory. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. And amen. Men and brethren, it's so important that we thank you for being part of this broadcast. And we know the Lord is going to, I believe in my spirit, there are some people, they're staring in you, cannot be stopped. Satan cannot stop you. See you in full manifestation. Uh, remember today, IMF United Kingdom is going to have study a conference at the Redeemed Assemblies Trust, 821 Old Kent Road, SE15 1NX. Today, this evening, about 6 p.m., the saints begin to gather so that they'll have a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord today. Whatever you may be, if you're in the United Kingdom and beyond, 
If you are a graduate of the School of Ministry or one who has been to any of the ministries that is connected with IMF, come. If you have friends, let them come. It's not closed. Everybody is open to everybody. You know what? Pastor Dupe and the leadership, trustees, advisory council, executive committee, they look forward to see you. Pastor Grace and I look forward to meet with you there and, you know, thank the Father together with you. It continues tomorrow. And by the grace of the Father, remember we also told you, Apostle Chima and I, about our hosting Apostle Vance and Debbie in Foundation Ministries Anniversary in Ennis. On Sunday, by the grace of the Father, this vessel will fly into Ennis for the ordination of those who graduated from the School of Ministry or Foundation Ministry Ennis. The next week, by the grace of the Father, the big, big weekend. Starting on Thursday, IMF USA Youth and Next Generation will meet and they will continue in the morning. Brother Samuel J. When we finish now, he'll talk to those online if it's available a little bit about the conference, just a few minutes. And then him, Pastor Jer uh, Prophet Jeremiah and others, the Lord is preparing them and we look forward to that day. Then on Friday, by 12 noon, will be the graduation ceremony or graduation service of the 2018 Masterclass, 12 noon. You know, in the same location, and I'll tell you that in a moment. Then the evening, the IMF USA National Conference for 2019 will open, and it will be till Sunday. And if you are in the 2019 Masterclass, you are in the United States or beyond, we'd love to see you that weekend. We're going to organize your induction, or what in the academic world what is called matriculation, it will be organized, commencement. And by the grace of the Father, all this will be taking place at you know, the four points by Sheraton in the city of Meriden, Connecticut, on Research Parkway, Meriden, Connecticut. You know what? It's going to be an awesome weekend, a weekend where the Father's grace will be manifested. And we're going to see also body ministry. We're going to see body ministry, the Lord walking together with us. No one is, is standing in the stead of each other. It's all us and him. Concerning bad days, we have today, I'm not too sure, but we have today listed Apostle Oscar Nkosi. Apostle Oscar Nkosi is a member of the National Advisory Council of IMF South Africa with his wife, Prophet Busi Nkosi. And our brother George, uh, Bo George Bob Satyada in India, and our brother Kainsile Madondo in Botswana. Bad days are today, and we'll pray for them. Now, Elect, thank you so much for being on the camera again. We look forward to tomorrow, Pastor Grace, you know, maybe she will be speaking to you live from the MFUK location. Have a blessed day.